So welcome, everybody. Thank you so much, Patrick. It's beautiful to move into the intimacy that you offered us here in this room. I want to thank Diane Harris for inviting Elliot and I to have an opportunity to speak with you. And thank you all for being here. I wanted to say just personally, I am a professor at the University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. And we you know, have been uh, you know, in the eye of this storm that we have talked about some last night. And I would really appreciate, I know there's a uh, desire here for everyone to have an opportunity to speak collaboratively with, with each other and plan their projects and learn about this program. And also there's a desire of some of us to talk about the issues that are happening on our campus in a wider context. And I would like to invite you to join me at lunchtime to talk about those issues and some kind of strategies that we can work on in the very near future to um, move forward with those issues. So well, I guess Elliot said it, but I wanted to start, you know, as a dancer and somebody who works very embodied, I'd like to invite you to join me in that. And so if everyone could just stand up. And um, this is some work that I developed during the Bird Brain Project, which um, followed the migrations of Gray whales, uh, gray whales up the Pacific coast, ospreys down the Atlantic flyway, and ducks and geese up the Mississippi flyway. And it was a way of inviting my audience to think about their own navigational and orientation strategies. So it really came from research into animal navigation and my own kind of <clears throat> somatic practices. So first I'd like to ask you to close your eyes. And just bring your attention to the way your feet are touching the floor beneath you. And that very delicate balancing act that we're constantly in. And there's a constant negotiation of our relationship with gravity to the surfaces we're touching. And bring your attention up to the skin on your face. Notice any movement of air that's passing across your neck or your throat. The quality of light, is it lighter or darker on one side or the other? Watching the breath for a moment as it's rising and falling in your torso. And using these tools to arrive in this particular place, in this particular moment. When you feel like you've arrived, I'd like you with your eyes closed to turn and face north. Open your eyes. There's a fair amount of agreement, but some disagreement. And just think about the ways that you've, you chose that direction. Was it an internal sense or a kind of spatial mapping that you did that tracked your entry into the building? And maybe just ask the person next to you how they oriented to the north. Okay, let's um, close our eyes one more time. Um, so now, with your eyes closed, I'd like you to turn and face where you were born. And you can still use your own orientational decision making.
And if you can open your eyes now and just take a glance around, everyone's facing in quite different directions. And now close your eyes again and turn to face where your parents were born. And again, there was a slight adjustment in the room that I can see from here that you could look around and see. Again, we're all facing. And then close your eyes and now turn and face the direction where your grandparents were born, if you know that. Or, of course, you have four grandparents, so they're going to be spinning around. <laughs> yeah, that's a great option there, indicating with your arms and you're facing maybe three or four different directions. And you can open your eyes again. So just looking at the, the, the facings that we have from this particular moment, we've created a kind of spatial diagram of how collectively we are shaping our ideas of the global Midwest with our bodies here in the room, and that each one of us sends out a kind of personal history and trajectory that is, you know, locates back into this room, the discussions we're having. So um, I want to start with a quote from Pauline Oliveros, who's an artist that I highly admire. And if you're not familiar with her work, she's developed a practice called deep listening. And of course, listening is kind of central to any collaborative uh, process. So she says, collaboration is understanding, accepting, and resonating with another's process. Each person should be able to walk his or her own path independently, either parallel, across, circling, or encircling, or whatever appropriate combinations need occur. In such independence, each person can be him or herself and perceive the other. It's a rich and rewarding situation. And this uh, uh, feels very directly related to what Patrick was talking with us as well. So this is from a very personal artist's point of view, but we could also um, easily place ideas or methods or theoretical frameworks into this equation. It's a little funny for me to be over here, but yes. um, I also want to point out in that quote the physicality of the description, really the specific language about movement and space. And you know, we're not here explicitly to advocate for you to introduce necessarily an element of embodied or kinetic process into your collaborations, but um, even being intentional about where a collaboration takes place can help stimulate a productive shift in the conversation. So this is the same people here and here and here. Um, so especially if there's a place involved in a project, spending time in collaboration in situ can be invaluable. And I, I think this is really to follow up on the remarks before, which so resonate with the work that we're doing. It's kind of fantastic, we're kind of this ongoing conversation that will continue um, in the panel. I, I'm thinking about this quote that Jennifer just read, um, I'd like to add, while I believe that collaboration really requires that you respect others that you're working with, it requires risk. This is something that we talk about constantly. And then it's a willingness to inhabit odd and unfamiliar situations and places and to probe so-called base assumptions. And this can lead to a kind of entanglement. So we, we, we often use this word entanglement. And it certainly can be extremely frustrating, and, and in the moment particularly so. But it's moving out of these entanglements or through these entanglements through these collisions that a creative realignment or movement forward can really happen. And our experience is this kind of thing is actually incredibly joyous. I think this notion of play, while kind of light motif that we haven't addressed explicitly, but certainly in relationship to games also is a big part of the work that we do. So what's that most valued here is a willingness to change one's perception and location in relation to one's own work and there can be both a desire to deepen and strengthen current ideas and an or to innovate new paradigms, methods, and confluences. So Island Interdisciplinary Laboratory of Art, Nature, and Dance uh, was sort of brought into being to support these kinds of collaborative research projects. And we developed this approach that we'll be talking with you today that we hope can create a kind of catalytic impact to new and transformative thinking. So 
over the years, ILAND has developed a very specific approach to interdisciplinary collaboration that is probably very rooted in the fact that it comes out of my own choreographic practice or in some ways um, the particular challenges of conveying knowledge and the questions that arise and the practices of choreographic thinking and embodying knowledge. So we have, we really emphasize the importance of actually particip participating in each other's methodologies and we'll see some examples of that. And um, the profound insights that come out of what happens when someone who is an expert in one area <coughs> allows themselves fully the experience of being a beginner in another area. When one brings an expert mind to being a beginner with a new form, new insights can occur. And this mode of working also breaks down these specific hierarchies or, um, and allows for cross-fertilization. So, Island really prioritizes process and actually developing new collaborative forms. And there's very little space in our current culture that just focuses on process without looking for a goal or a main or an exterior product. So this is, you know, it's a kind of very liberating space for us and we hope that it will be inspirational and help you think about your own collaborative projects, even though yours are going to have very specific and brilliant goals in mind. And so we've found this very rich and gratifying and challenging and very hard to define, as you'll see, we're working out ways of articulating that. I just want to talk a little bit more about what ILAND is. I'm on the board of ILAND, have been so since 2009, which I was on the board, I think, briefly in 2005 as well. Um, but it's a community of people from diverse disciplinary backgrounds who share a passion for urban ecology, collaborative practice, and kinetic experience. As a dance research organization, and really emphasizing research rather than product, rather than you know, a, a, an emphasis on performance, we're interested in the intersection, overlay, and the invention of different modes of knowledge, bringing together movement artists and scientists, visual artists and designers to share practices. And there are certainly artist scientist collaborations are increasingly common. I think what we're doing is different in that we're creating an opportunity to people, for people to work outside the parameters of their given specialty. Again, this is very resonating with the talk before. Um, and one, the other main principle that grounds the work of Island and, and the residencies that we'll talk about is this idea of improvisation. So improvisational modes allow for adaptation, indeterminacy, and a dynamism that is central to both understanding dance and urban ecosystems. And our residencies really use the city as a whole, New York City, um, as a workspace. We don't, we don't have a space for the residency. What we always say is we provide time rather than space. And, and this is time to explore, to be wrong, to have failures, and really to generate new ways of working. So the how of how we figure this out, we'll be showing you through some examples of these iLab residencies. So over the past eight years, we supported 13 uh, residency teams who've used different parts of the city. This is Dead Horse Bay and Jamaica Bay. Um, this is underneath the Kosciuszko Bridge in Queens. Uh, this is Willits Point, this amazing part of Queens that is no longer, will no longer <laughs> exist soon. It's kind of outside of any kind of regulatory system in New York City. A lot of people who fix cars and fix anything um, worked here. There. Uh, and we'll talk about that in another, and this is one of our retreats that we did up in Massachusetts with a group of residencies. So we, the, the, the kind of breadth and depth that we've, of knowledge we've gathered from the ecosystems themselves and the different areas that we've worked. Um, one residency that we'll talk about later used the, the weather systems generated by the urban heat island as their site. Um, and we also, one of the important things about the way we define site is that it, of course, includes the, not only the ecosystem and environmental concerns, but also the social and political and cultural communities that inhabit the ecosystem, very much influenced by urban ecology thinking. So I mentioned before that Island sort of came out of this as a picture of a performance we did in San Francisco during the Gray Rail migration that when I finished that project, I was so stimulated and excited by the ways in which my own research 
had shifted dramatically by the conversations I was having with scientists and uh, conservationists and habitat restoration folks. Both, you know, we, we collaborated with small grassroots environmental and arts organizations along the routes and all the performances were outdoors. So something about dancing outside for eight to 10 weeks really shifted my knowledge also. And I felt like I really wanted to, to continue working in this way but not limit it just to my own artistic practice. So I set up Island as an opportunity to bring other people together to work on these kind of collaborative projects. And I just wanted to throw in a slide on some of the work that I do. I'm trained as a landscape architect, I was um, mentioned before. And for me, rather than show work pre-Island, this is work post-Island that really has been influenced by the collaborations that I've both witnessed as a mentor with the residencies that we've uh, hosted over the years, and also working really explicitly with Jennifer. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, this is um, called Gowanus Field Stations. I'll just say briefly, it's an exploration of an ecology of a very derelict, extremely derelict, is an extremely contaminated canal in um, southern Brooklyn. It's now a super fun site. And the idea was to explore a sectional relationship of the body. So work that I do is spatial. It, it, it thinks about the body in space, but really making me dance, making me think of my body as an instrument has translated into thinking more explicitly at how design, how my design can really facilitate these kinds of knowledges. Again, that there's cerebral knowledge, there's, there's this specific understanding of what's happening here, the ecology here, there's a massive amount of scientific research being done in the Gowanus, in part in relationship to the Superfund, but there's also this other kind of knowledge of being in a place um, and, 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 and actually having access to the cerebral knowledge while also engaging this kind of kinetic knowledge. Um, and just to reiterate, I think we're gonna come back to this notion of really valuing process over product and finding, kind of maybe ironically, that this has been a very productive uh, space. Um, also, I think this is what makes the collaborations that Island supports quite different, in that seeing collaboration not as a means to an end, but really saying that collaboration itself is an explicit topic. Um, of these residencies. And so how does our collaborative process look like given the parameters of a particular residency with a particular set of people? Whether, you know, each time the residents begin, it's a very different dynamic, a different set of, of disciplines at the table. Um, what new hybrid methodologies and practices can be developed from this entangling, again, of multiple disciplines? Not only a collision of ideas and practices, but a retooling to push beyond disciplinary modes of understanding. It's really, it's an experiment. and. I think, again, <laughs> I love the, the conversation between the first presentation and ours, is collaborations as such really challenge us to develop more complex processes to match the complexity of the issues and questions of the research that we're talking about. So iLab is the name for the residencies themselves. So iLand is the organization, iLab, um, and these are sort of the, the prompts that we give to residents when they apply for a summer residency typically um, we, we require at least two weeks on site, but it's over a summer. Um, and this is just a, a kind of prompt for us. Um, Jennifer and I met in a kind of traditional architect client relationship. She was looking at a building on a street that I now live on, which is kind of amazing, um, to transform into a residence and a, a studio. And that kind of didn't gain traction and for a whole bunch of economic and complicated New York City reasons. And we then shifted to thinking about a mobile performance space for Jennifer. And in developing the ideas about what this thing would look like and how it would perform, Jennifer made models, which is a typical technique that architects and landscape architects use. And Jennifer had one of my partners and I dance. And it was this very catalytic ex experience for us, suddenly to feel what it means for us to be designing a, dis a dance performance space and actually having dance. What are, you know, what are the requirements, not suddenly from a, again, from a, okay, here's a list of the space that one needs or here's how it needs to operate, but actually understanding that in the you know, direct, unmediated kind of way. And so this mobile architecture was gonna be activated in this project I was doing on the Ridgewood Reservoir, which was um, originally water source for Brooklyn and then became abandoned. And 
now is kind of 60 acres of gorgeous urban wilderness. Um, we did a year-long project and Thread Collective designed um, some yeah. images. This is, you can see that's like right in the middle of Brooklyn and Queens. And part of the <clears throat> reservoirs have been drained and we spent a lot of time in the site with uh, scientists who studied native plants, insects, fish, birds. We invited the Brooklyn Bird Club to do a breeding bird count. And then during the year that we were working on this, the city decided to make this a destination park. Um, and they were going to destroy this, tear down the reservoir, drain it, and build ball fields and kind of recreational sports fields. Um, and already there was a kind of, already a constituency there of the, the local community. That were, you, we were there two or three times a week for a year. So we really saw how well used this site was by a really diverse group of people and inhabitants in that neighborhood, using it to collect um, plants, to ride their bicycles, to take walks, to uh, do there was, rituals. Um, well, there were, uh, there were, if inside the canal, I mean the canal, the, the reservoir itself, there were paint, huge paintball kind of territories. There was a whole overlay of people looking at it as this amazing ecology, and then other people using it as I'm almost a kind of, again, this sort of notion of a backstage space, a space that didn't have really explicit programming, so it uh, had a looseness in terms of kinds of behaviors that typical parks not, not necessarily yeah. um, support. It was a very, it's a very dynamic site. So the community organized uh, partly in response to learning about the site through our project to combat this plan for the city, and we just learned last month that they've been successful at designating it as wetlands area so it will not be destroyed. So we're really thr thrilled about that, and it kind of shows this ongoing impact of being in place and researching and sharing and engaging the, the site and the, with the local community. So as we've worked with these, developing these residencies, it's a core group of the island board that's been mentoring and witnessing and seeing there are certain values and approaches that keep coming up. And we felt a strong desire to articulate and distill this material as a way of pushing forward these collaborative mechanisms so that each residency wasn't just reproducing something, but building on the past residencies, not as any kind of prescriptive model, but just sort of building on experience. And it's interesting for us that we didn't set out to design that, but it just sort of came out of the process. It was very organic um, that we felt compelled to do this to provide this information not only to future iLab residents, but to a wider community of people who are working on collaboration. So for us, it's incredibly gratifying to be here and share this knowledge and hope that it might be useful to you. Yeah, this, so this funny definition here, I think really captures in some ways, this the slippery nature of talking about something that has very few edges. We often talked about eye landing as being a porous container. Um, and we really struggled with what we were going to call this thing. Was it a method? Was it a process? Is it a se set of rules? Is it a set of cards that you could pick from and, and instigate kind of shifts in perspective? We sort of ended up with this idea of it as a platform, kind of a shared set of resources. Um, and then, so what we're going to show from here in is a, a series of examples of the residencies and kind of grouped around basic principles that we've distilled looking back at eight years of this. And the one thing that Elliot's always reminding me of and pointing out that this isn't in any kind of linear order. We've done it this way for this presentation, but you could enter this process in any, at any point. Yeah, this, this slide suggests linearity or kind of a sequence by numbers. Um, certainly, creating meaningful public engagements is as important as any of the other elements. And definitely, and we'll see, isn't something that happens at the end. The collaboration doesn't kind of have a life and then you show the work. That the work is fundamentally linked to a constant reassessing through public engagements. Um, just to reiterate this idea of really engaging the site um, an ecosystem as a collaborator, something that we talk about intensively. And then um, this negotiation of the relationship between the site and human action, developing interdisciplinary hybrid models and practices of sharing process, but also individuals' understanding. So that, that 
interplay between the independence <coughs> that the first quote talked about and this kind of entanglement that's also really necessary. So um, we're starting with this kind of topic of focus, um, which may seem like, a, of course, every project needs to have kind of a thing around which it's organized, but by removing the performance or product from the way that we frame residencies, we kind of remove a typical driver for collaborations. So it's really critical that there's clear and kind of boundaries and constraints, but that they can shift in the residency. And we use this idea of focus, sort of like a telescope, that it's something that's it's dynamic, you can zoom in and out. It's not, the boundary is there, but it's not a boundary that's hard, it's a kind of soft boundary. Um, and there's also this inter interesting tension between the need to have these sort of well-defined parameters and a process that really allows and, and really maybe even encourages tangents. So there's a kind of intelligence about moving between structure and looseness that this particular residency we felt um, embodied. This is, they were called stratospores, is a photograph that, um, they, that they termed their family portrait. And I think gives you know, the snapshot about the, the complexity of teams um, this we have here, uh, Kate Cahill is an architect, Chris Kennedy, an environmental engineer with a master's in arts education, who also is an installation artist and interested in kind of radical pedagogies, Caroline Willard, who's a social practice artist, Athena Kokoronis, a chef and choreographer, and mycologist, um, Gary Linkoff, who hunted mushrooms with John Cage and wrote the um, Audubon book on East Coast mushroom hunting. Um, so their stratospore was looking at investigating mushrooms as a metaphor for latent potential and unseen infrastructure as a model to explore urban, in, uh, urban ecosystems and including this sort of cultural ecosystem through a culinary perspective. Um, one of the tricky things for us to show things to you today is, is that we're using photographs and photographs may be not the most ideal way of capturing the kinds of processes that we're most interested in. Um, so this suggests that it was kind of a traditional um, a set of performances. There's some of the photographs that we had, but the things that they, that they in their research included, and using this sort of mus mushroom research as a platform for, um, included performance-based art, experiential learning, experimental design practices, and this kind of complexity of, of event or activity was all held together by this single focus. This is the a residency called Through Earth, Through Body, Through Speech, and their area of focus was very broadly diversity, but they were looking at it specifically through Flushing Meadows Park and the World's Fair that was there. Again, this was a kind of contested political site. Bloomberg wanted to expand the tennis stadium, build a new soccer stadium, and build a huge big shopping mall. Uh, the local community was opposed to this. They were trying to find a voice. And the, um, this group of, it was a collective called Fantastic Futures, which is five visual artists um, and new media artists, and then uh, urban ecologists and genetic biologists who was studying diversity in Ma common mammals in the city. So looking at white-footed mice and salamanders and rats. So and he's kind of looking at the urban spectrum from the urban to the rural. So they spent a lot of time on this site interviewing and talking to locals and then activating these kind of practices that came directly from Jason South's research. Uh, this site is adjacent to Willits Point. Um, and this is a small video of one of the movement exercises that they developed uh, from their research of looking at how mice, of course, the idea of cover is very important to them, right? They, for them, it's much safer to be under trees or bushes. And, um, so they designed this movement exercise out of this. Oh, we don't have sound. No, this isn't so great without sound, but imagine that essentially this is Jennifer and myself here, this is some other folks, then kind of um, analyzing what it was like to inhabit the behavior of a mouse within a public park. She's kind of speaking about anxiety and this kind of visceral experience she had. 
uh, Levi's talking about how interesting it was to be in a park where the open space was the dangerous space. I think as humans, we tend to think of the more um, covered areas as unsafe and So this, uh, one of the, the, the importance of site that we keep uh, referencing, this is the group that was using the Urban Heat Island as their site. And they were working with this amazing, with Liz Berry, who was part of the plot. So do any of you know about the Public Laboratory for Open Technology and Science? They're an amazing group of people that are really radical in providing technology at all levels to a wide group of people, and they're kind of uh, working against the dominance that Google has in terms of giving us information about our world <laughs> in a map way. So they use weather balloons and kites, and they put cameras on them, and they fly them up into the air and get these amazing images. But uh, also, they've been able to get this very localized and precise knowledge about, for even example, the Gowanus Canal that Elliot was talking about earlier, about pollution streams that the uh, Department of Environmental Protection hadn't picked up. They've identified a Civil War cemetery in Brooklyn and some early creek beds and things. There's a kind of precision to this kind of local knowledge and not relying on the corporate models of mapping where we are in the world. So for me, the site is really that tension between the body and the kite and learning to fly kites. You become so aware of your own embodied relationship to this force above you. Uh, and you can see this is Laelia Weidman. She's a choreographer, and her own practice was profoundly influenced and transformed by uh, thinking about weather and the, and, and the conditions of weather in the in urban environments that are so influenced by the height of buildings and these kind of canyons that are shaped. Uh, another way of looking at site, in, in part, this is, oh yeah, this is super blown out. Um, this uh, residency was called Follow the Water Walks. They were looking at the East Tremont watershed, which is a physical territory, but is essentially an invisible demarcation or boundary. And so for them, the site was, or the work was making that site visible through human action, through literally taking walks with community participants to follow where stormwater would go, to follow where historical creeks would connect to the Bronx River. And in doing so, the other, so we think about their project, the site also being the community. It was a collaboration between um, a scientist who uses GIS to study watersheds, a choreographer, Paloma McGregor, and the executive director, or artistic director rather, education director <laughs> of the Bronx River Alliance, um, uh, Damien Griffin. So for them, um, these walks in collaboration with community participants, these interactions cultivated and supported a kind of understanding, a stewardship, and then really created an agency among the Bronx residents. And I think the other thing about how a particular residency approaches site is how, um, for them, there's an interplay between um, maybe more traditional technological GIS data collection and then a performative using the body as a datum on the ground research. And their question was, how might a sort of qualitative, embodied, intuitive knowledge also inform fundamentally the redesign of the city as we begin to really grapple with how do we you know, manage stormwater throughout um, our urban areas? And this is a nice link to research methodologies. This is a residency with a choreographer named Teresa Duhon and a, a bird biologist, Colin Grubel. He was studying the feeding habits of cormorants in the New York Harbor. They would go out to the islands and collect bird uh, cormorant vomit and bring it back to the lab, dissect it, put the bones together, and then identify which, uh, what type of fish it was based on the skeletal remains. So this is Teresa doing that practice in the lab. So that's very kind of rigorous. And uh, again, this you know, needs tons of experience to be able to do this. But what you learn when you allow yourself to attempt something like that. And, and at the same time, Colin participated in all of the rehearsals that were outside. <laughs> they developed movement scores and material based on uh, the feeding habits of cormorants and the life cycle behaviors. 
and of fish as well. Um, and again, this is kind of playful and interaction between a public space and the research. Other kinds of data collection really are about engaging the public in different ways. Um, this is a project called Rivered Creek that was also looking at waterways, but maybe from a, from a more historical perspective. Um, so you see traditional so-called scientific data collection, but with a whole broad group of, of the public engaging with that. They also used kinetic research to really explore kind of what the edge experience is. And then they developed these funny tools, small-scale tools, to, to um, I want to say mimic or provide the, the sensory experience of what it might have been like to walk on a marshland that would have once been in this area. So they made these little kind of sponge shoes. I used them. They were fantastic. They look goofy. And, and it seems like a, maybe a strategy that that simple and almost that literal would be kind of absurd. But really, again, this knowledge that came through, all right, if, if I'm so used to the pavement of the city, and there's a kind of you know, weight that is associated with that suddenly transformed, even with the slimmest bit of sponge underneath your foot, with a suddenly springy experience. Language, I think you referenced also, I keep thinking how great these talks are going together. Um, it's incredibly important to be extremely rigorous about these divergent meetings. We had an amazing conversation at a workshop a couple of weeks ago about the, the word site. You know, there were people who were coming from really radical backgrounds, site versus place versus space, what those things kind of carried, how they resonated, how problematic some of them were versus others. And that's true with any residencies. There's sort of a period in which you need to navigate maybe familiar terms that are really differently used within various disciplines. But, and the intent there isn't necessarily to kind of get rid of these divergent meetings or to avoid creative misunderstandings. So much really interesting work happens when there is kind of slippage or friction. Um, but you know, the intent, as I said, is to, to rigorously investigate where these divergent meanings come from, how they reflect and shape a particular perspective. And then there's a possibility um, to see residents in unlikely places. And in this case, um, this residency was called New York City from a Plant's Perspective. It had a, the native plant curator from the Brooklyn Botanical Garden, um, a choreographer and a landscape architect and visual artist three of those folks, and they started with this premise of that plants, landscapes, and people move all the time. Just very simple, like, let's figure out how there's the kind of resonances around this idea of movement. And they developed um, this metrics, and it was catalyzed by, by a very brief conversation about how plants and ballet movements have uh, kind of comparable strategies. I'm gonna try to zoom in a little on this. So you can see here, we've got bending, and each of these, so they, how about, this is one of many pages, a series of terms coming from a, a ballet culture, or ballet language, and then applying that very carefully across, not just dance broadly, dance in terms of the human movement potential, choreographic structures, botany, so it's each of these residents is sort of taking on, what does it mean for a plant to bend? What um, kind of individual plant form might that be? How does that differ when it's a plant community? One of the great kind of revelations that they came up with is that, um, or pieces of information, was that individual plants, particularly meadows, don't often have sufficient um, strength to, to stand up straight, but it requires the collective to do that. Um, these, again, are also deployed across other disciplines, understanding what bending means and how it could be applied in these other languages. I'm gonna pop back to full screen mode. And then one of the things we really prioritize is this balance between the solo and the collective, uh, that it's very easy to get wrapped in the kind of collaborative experience of working together, but that really needs to be balanced by time alone. So we really encourage our residents to spend time working independently. And I'm just referencing my own piece, Live Dancing Archive, that Diane mentioned after these years of collab large-scale collaborative projects. I made this solo, and I could not have made that solo without the collaborative experience behind it. And I couldn't have made the solo collaboratively, although it ended up being collaboratively. But there was something about the, the space of working alone that was so fed by the collaborative, but they really needed distance from each other. 
So we really encourage that as well. And we also really encourage fallow time. Again, there's not much space in our culture for this kind of fallow time, but we all know how important it is. Uh, um, in terms of the residencies, it's really important for people to have meals together and relax and take time out and um, be social and imaginative and creative. And that really, you need to schedule that in. It doesn't happen in our lives that are so mediated now with technology and stuff, so we really encourage our residents to take that time with each other. Um, another kind of principle that we have is this pressure or requirement or need to document. And as I said earlier, sort of one of the funny things about this presentation is it relies on images um, to be the armature to talk about things that are often very difficult, if not fully impossible, to photograph. Um, that said, we really encourage iLab residents to be comprehensive and layered, meaning to use multiple tactics with documentation, and then to do it at multiple times along the process, to document while things are happening, in this case, identifying a mushroom. This, this um, photograph is actually a woman who's now on the iLab uh, island board and is a copious note taker. She's really amazing. But so in the moment, even when things are kind of heated and complicated, really having ways, not necessarily by notes, but finding ways, again, that, that come from various disciplines that allow to capture um, moments during the process, to have distance, so periods away from that moment. So there's a revelatory moment, so it might take a couple of days, a small journal entry, some reflection, and then even further distance, um, to also create some kind of platform for capturing collective discussions. Online things, of course, are great for doing that. This is the stratus for um, residency that I showed earlier. And then having some, again, this notion, we're not by removing the pressure of product, that doesn't mean that there isn't really important moments where kind of having a, f a final element isn't useful. And for this case, they created this little booklet of ephemera. And so, again, each kind of telescoping um, moment of time away from this maybe some very big pivot has its own set of revelations. And this is an example of a score. Many of you might be familiar with the way a music or a compositional score is generated. But as Elliot was talking about, it's sometimes difficult to document the very improvisational and indeterminate nature of an ephemeral nature of dance and ecological systems. So one of the methods that we use in improvisational dance is a score. It's almost kind of set of instructions that are repeatable, but they don't reproduce the same thing. So we found that a very useful way to, their, uh, to revisit and repeat without necessarily focusing on a kind of replication. Uh, so this is a process we use quite a lot. Um, this is a kind of board that we trot out often when we're trying to talk about eye landing in general in kind of a concise way. And it shows, again, this sort of notion of, of the thing itself, the score on the left-hand side, photograph of where we did it, um, a documentation right after the score, sorting out, well, what, what actually did we do? How did we think about it? And then the text that you're seeing around that, again, it's a little bit blown out or a lot blown out, is thinking about um, what that event was three or four months later. And then the last piece here, also a little bit hard to read, is something that we're working on right now, which is creating a taxonomy for all these residencies, an online, and we've also talked about a physical thing, place in which Again, we think about iLanding as a platform or set of resources where you can search for different kinds of how did this particular score play out? What were the strategies involved? What particular kinds of collaborators were involved? It's something that we're working out. Um, and I don't want to say to um, sort of uh, maybe slightly problematic that we have public engagement at the end, it suggests that it is a kind of culmination. And many of the photographs that you've seen thus far actually are elements of public engagement. And this is something, you know, while we remove the pressure for product, we do ask that people have numerous ways in which the public interfaces with their process. And really, to, part of it is to say that this work isn't insular, right? It's not just, it is fundamentally about this group of people, but that it has stretches and, and is also expanded by the intersection of, of a public. And it gives the public also an opportunity to engage with their environment and, and their place within that environment in unexpected ways. Um, yeah, it's something that we say is seeded throughout the process. 
These are just some examples. So these are looking like kind of more traditional performances. This is the mycologist going on a forage for mushrooms, I'm pretty sure, in Central Park. Um, kite flying in Union Square to document the people gathering there, using the body as a datum in the follow the river walks. This is, uh, we have an annual symposium that gives us an opportunity to share in possibly a slightly more formal way the research that's come out of the iLab residencies. Um, so we invite people who are working on similar themes to be in conversation with our residents to develop those ideas further. And so here's a kind of wrap up of these principles that we've gone through. Um, and just to really reiterate that this is not a sequence, it's a feedback loop that one could enter into this process at any point, that it's highly iterative. This is something that, again, we think about design education does support a kind of um, some int uh, sort of, uh, entry point into collaboration, but it also really emphasizes iteration. It's something that we constantly return to, is that you may allow for fallow time and then return to the idea of site as collaborator, you know, always refocusing, redefining that set of intentions that drove the project in the beginning. Um, actually, I don't want to say a couple more things before I go to that image. Um, the other thing, just to sort of think these things to take away on, these basic principles, you know, they really, to some, repeat something that Jennifer said before, these are coming from the particulars of dance and urban ecology. And I think, you know, some of these may resonate more highly with you. I think figuring out how these various tools can be applied across other disciplines is something that we're super interested in. Hopefully we can maybe tackle when we are um, sitting at the panel. Um, but I think the other kind of thing that we would love to say is that this is a real value of being self-reflective on the nature of collaboration itself. Even if you are driven by a, by a product, by a, a kind of final paper or a final publication, that to be very mindful of the dynamics during the process, to kind of bounce in and out of work, doing the work itself and then thinking about sort of this meta collaborating on the idea of collaboration. Um, and to be extremely intentional about the process because of its, na its sort of risky nature, because of the complications, because of the moments of real, and I want to use this word, extremely, can be extremely frustrating. It can feel highly inefficient. You might think, well, if I just were sitting at home alone, I would definitely be done. <laughs> but that the work that comes out of that is fundamentally different than the work that you would be doing otherwise. Um, I want to say a couple more things. I want to sort of give you an odd invitation. Um, partly because I feel like working with Island has really stretched me in these amazing ways, is to, to invite you to, to embrace a practice or discipline that you think you are bad at. It's a really great, it's just a really amazing thing to do. It's also great about, it makes your own practice better, I believe. Um, for me, this was dance. It still might be dance for a little bit. But I have a new sense of my body as this calibrated instrument. And I just wanted to read um, this Thing that I wrote um, after doing the, the, one of the scores. Um, so mapping for me is a really native language, a, a familiar way to think through and record the overlap of experience in place. But performing a kinetic response to these same pieces um, was really, is not <laughs> at all a native language for me. I had to ask like, how do I physically enact a love of topography? What does it look like to show a curiosity about the tactility of plants or the pleasure of lines? Then eye landing has always pushed me into slightly awkward, I use this word a lot, but totally rewarding mental and physical places. Um, it's also was novel and invigorating for me to map with people who, um, for whom the map is an unfamiliar and for them slightly awkward strategy. The first map that we did, this is um, from an image before, was sequential, almost narrative, a description of where we went. But the second map got into more unusual abstract territory, starting with a simple question of how did we choose our location in the, in the landscape? This is one of the steps in the score. And having, we would both done the choosing us individually and observing the other two do that, we felt that there was this intense nuan, nuanced reading of the landscape. This is something that I think I do all the time, it's my job. But suddenly I was talking about it with two people who don't do it in, on a daily basis whatsoever and really coming up with a whole new way of talking about, and, and, a, and a much more careful way of talking about something that seemed fundamentally familiar to me. Um, and this, this drawing, drawing was really an armature for us to collectively develop a language for this dialectic relationship between humans and surroundings, the quiet and the odd, the spatial and the sonic, the geologic and botanical, and that these soft pressures had pulled and pushed us along. 
So for me, also drawing and diagramming was an uncom uncomfortable practice. And I was working with Kate Cahill, who we've referenced here, an architect. And she was dancing. And um, so oh, she was watching us dance. Oh, this dancing is like a diagram. So diagramming has become very much a part of my practice. And um, I wanted to invite all of you to diagram with uh, or diagram together. So Jason has some paper if you have your own piece of paper. And I thought we'd just take three minutes and each diagram our own understanding of the global Midwest. And then we can look at them with, with two or three other, or three or four other people, and then see if we could quickly sketch out a collaborative diagram that combines our different ways. So we have a chance to practice maybe, uh, just th diagramming for me is a way of showing relationships between things. So it's not so much about like drawing or whatever. And your diagram could even primarily be text-based, but just somehow that you can spatially arrange your thoughts and definitions of the global Midwest.